who is Ian, Ian Goodfellow. Uh, he's a research scientist working in machine learning. He earned his PhD at the University of Montre at the Université de Montréal. He's the inventor of generative adversarial networks and also the author of this great uh, deeplearningbook.org. We also got uh, Kevin Lewin from NVIDIA Deep Learning. He was at UC Berkeley and then he uh, helped build the UC Merced. He's been teaching many, many thousands of students in, in many classes. And now he's uh, at NVIDIA disseminating deep learning. Then we have from Oxford, we have uh, Andrew Trask, who's also the author of a great book, Grokking Deep Learning, and he's a current PhD student at Oxford University. Uh, and he's uh, part, in the part of our nano degree, as you can see him uh, giving many of our lectures and labs. And last but not least, we got our very own Sira Shraval, data scientist, best-selling author, and uh, hilarious YouTube star, who is uh, hosting our, our Deep Learning Nano Degree Foundations course, and who also will be the host of today. Uh, and let me introduce to you our uh, founder, Sebastian Thrun, for some words. Hey, thank you. Thank you. What's the local time in Oxford? Uh, it's like 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. I have a, a green can in celebration of St. Patrick's Day, even though I'm 100% Irish free. Um, <laughs> it's great to see you all. It's great to see you guys online. Um, it's a, a very deep satisfaction thing for me to see you guys here because I just picture myself as you when I was your age in Germany, stuck trying to understand artificial intelligence. None of my professors back had a clue about it, and I survived by going to local libraries. Super excited about the panel. No, I don't want to see much time here. The only thing I want to toss in is um, deep learning, machine learning is now the hottest thing officially in Silicon Valley. 75% um, of us adults work in offices and doing the same repetitive menial thing over and over again. And if you guys succeed, then you can bring this down to 2%. And the way it's going to work is about 300 years ago, 90% of us worked in agriculture and farming, using our muscles to do the same menial stupid things over and over again. We've plowed the fields and, and milked the cows. And then someone invented the steam engine. And all of a sudden, we were like 100 times strong. And we didn't even have as many, as many farmers anymore. So right now, in the United States, about 2% farmers. And in, in the UK, it's 1%. So if you invent really great AI that make people who do repetitive work really, really strong, they can do 100 times the work, then we might need as, uh, many fewer office workers. And you might uh, build a nice business on the side. So it's a really hot topic. Uh, without further ado, it's great having you guys here. Thing. All right, there we go. Okay, awesome. So yeah, we have some amazing people here right now. This is awesome. Hold on. Okay, great. This works. Okay, so yeah, I mean, Ian is, I mean, th I have had so many questions about GANs. It's incalculable over the past few weeks, and Ian's the guy who invented them. Uh, and uh, Kelvin works at N NVIDIA, which is an amazing company. You know, a lot of the the boom happening in deep learning right now is because of NVIDIA's GPUs and how awesome they are. They democratized it uh, quite a bit for a lot of people. Trask is one of the best technical writers in the game. Uh, and of course, Matt is an amazing instructor here at Udacity. So this is an awesome panel, and we're very excited that you guys are here right now. So let's uh, get right into it. Uh, the first thing we want to start off with is a presentation by Ian. So uh, Ian, do you want to you go for it? Yeah, sure. I figured I'll tell you all a little bit about some of the topics in machine learning that I'm most interested in right now. Basically, everything I focus on these days. Uh, everything I focus on these days is related to what I call adversarial machine learning. Normal machine learning, you have a bunch of data that you get in your training set, and you fit your model to that training set, and then you go out and you apply that model on test data. And so far, most of the theory guiding the development of machine learning has been based on this assumption that the data that you get at training time is basically the same as the data that you get at test time. Uh, that implicitly means, is there anything I should do about the mic to make that happen less, or? No, you're good. Okay, yeah. Um, that, this assumption that the training data and the test data are more or less the same implicitly means that there's no opportunity for someone to interfere with the operation of the model. And that is probably not a very realistic way to conceive of the way that a lot of products are actually used. 
because there are a lot of different machine learning applications where someone actually has an incentive to come and interfere with them. Now that machine learning has started to work really well, when there's no one interfering with it, we can actually get human level performance at things like recognizing faces or transcribing text or recognizing objects and images. We're now starting to tackle the harder problem of making machine learning work really well when someone is trying to break it. One of the main things I study is adversarial examples. They're inputs to the model that are chosen by a malicious adversary to cause the model to incorrectly process that input. So you can take things like an image that you might be able to recognize as being a school bus, and you can very slightly modify that image in a way where a human may not actually see that anything has changed about that image, but the machine learning model will now recognize it as being an ostrich rather than a school bus. These problems turn out to be pervasive enough that you can actually find inputs that will fool more than one model. So you can design an input to fool your model, and then you can deploy it against some remotely hosted target model, and you can fool that model too, even though you don't actually have access to the internals of the target model. So that means that attackers can actually exploit these issues uh, to, to control models that they, they don't get to control directly. It's, not only a theoretical problem that you can inflict on models that you actually host on your own machine. The other thing that's really interesting about these adversarial examples is that they're robust enough that you can actually display them in the real world, out in physical reality, not in, inside your laptop. And they will actually still fool machine learning classifiers that look at these examples through a camera. Even though the camera imposes different perspective and lighting and lens transformations and then maybe uses some kind of JPEG encoding to collect the image. Even though all of that process changes the image quite a lot, the attacker can still design an image that looks perfectly normal to a human being but gets completely misrecognized by the machine learning system. Uh, so I spent a lot of my time trying to design machine learning systems that are harder for attackers to break. One really interesting way that you can think about fooling a machine learning classifier is if you think about training a classifier that decides if an input is real or fake and trying to fool that classifier. You can think of this classifier as being a little bit like an anomaly detector, kind of like the way the credit card companies detect fraud by looking for transactions that are unusual. It turns out that if you uh, design this game between an attacker who's trying to fool your anomaly detector and the anomaly detector, which is trying to do better and better at detecting anomalous data, you can prove that there's an equilibrium point where the attacker has to generate data that looks exactly like the training data. That's the basis for generative adversarial networks, the machine learning framework that I invented back when I was at University of Montreal. They enable us to create data that looks just like the training set. We can make new images that look like training set images. Uh, scientists can do things like generate examples of distributions of dark matter or generate simulations of outcomes of particle accelerator experiments. In the future, we'll be able to do this for more and more kinds of data. Maybe we'll be able to synthetically generate Udacity courses. Who knows? Um, but I find this a really exciting topic to work on. There's also a lot of different things that you can do with generative adversarial networks besides just generate data. One thing is that the classifier that you train to look at this data and say whether it's real or fake can also be used to categorize the data, just like a traditional multi-class classifier. And training it with this process actually makes it become a lot more accurate with a lot less training data because it gets to learn from all of the different fake scenarios that the generator network imagines. Um, so these two different topics, adversarial examples for machine learning security problems and generative adversarial networks for generative modeling, both unify this idea of studying what happens when machine learning algorithms have to face off against an adversary that tries to break the algorithm. And they take us from the study of optimization problems, where we look for a model that minimizes a cost function, to the study of games in the sense of game theory, where now we have two different players who are each trying to optimize their own costs. It turns out that looking for an equilibrium of a game is much harder than looking for the minimum of a cost function. And so this whole branch of machine learning revolves around designing new methods for finding equilibriums in games. And that's one of the things that I spend a lot of my time thinking about, is how to actually find these equilibria. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Drew. 
Hello? Hello? Looks like we have a little bit of, okay, there we go. I just, okay, great. So okay, that's, that's awesome. So when I, so this, this idea of generative adversarial networks is a very cool one. Uh, Jan LeCun, the guy who uh, is one of the godfathers of convolutional nets, of the networks we use for image classification and a lot of image-related tasks, said that GANs are like one of the coolest ideas in the past, I think, decade or something like that, or two decades. So it's pretty cool. Um, when, when I think about the brain, when I think about the human brain, I don't really think about adversarial examples. I, I think about like cooperative examples. I, I think of it as, a, as one whole, you know, everything is working together. Neurons are working together. But the idea of an adversarial approach is very interesting. So my question to you, Ian, is uh, how did you come up with this idea? Uh, wh what were you doing? And, and I guess this can also be generalized to how in general do you come up with your research ideas? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, for Gans, the short story is that I was arguing with my friends in a bar. Uh, the longer story is that sometime earlier, my, my thesis advisor, Yashua Bengio, had been talking about running a speech synthesis contest. And we wanted to think of a way of evaluating all the different entries in that speech synthesis contest. A lot of the ways that people generate data are based on writing down a function that measures how likely certain data points are. So you can imagine that a really good speech data, a speech synthesizer would be able to assign really high likelihood to all the test data. But we realized that you might actually get some submissions that can only generate data and not say how likely it is. So I had the idea of using a discriminator network that would look at the test data and say whether it looked real or fake. We decided that people in the contest would probably just game the system, that whatever discriminator network we chose, they would come up with examples that could fool it. So I was thinking a lot about adversarial examples. Then Christian Zegedy had already discovered adversarial examples for classifiers. And in the end, we didn't run the contest. But I had this idea in the back of my mind that maybe you could have a model that looks at data and says whether it's real or fake. The thing that clicked there in the bar was this idea of having the discriminator continually learn at the same time that the generator is learning. When we were thinking of running the contest, we were thinking of having just a fixed discriminator, and then people could game it. But if both models learn, they're driven to this equilibrium where it becomes impossible to fool the discriminator. And then in general, for getting research ideas, I think it's important to talk to a lot of different people and think about a lot of different things. I've never really accomplished anything all that great just by sitting down and putting my nose to the grindstone and doing my main project. It's important to do that main project because it sets you up for doing something great and unexpected. While you're working hard on your main project, you'll learn a lot about the field and get a good idea of what all the difficult problems are. And then later you'll be talking to someone else about something completely unrelated and you'll figure out how to solve this other problem that comes up in that conversation. That's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, ideas. There's a lot of them, uh, and and recently, I I I've, I've noticed an uptick in uptick in really cool ideas. Like, for example, uh, so Trask, Trask doesn't drop a blog post frequently, but when he does, it's a banger. So one that he just released was uh, on homomorphic encryption and using uh, AI using homomorphic encryption to prevent an AI from. Uh, noticing what's happening outside of it. So basically, it's a way to control the AI. Uh, so Trask, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, like what, uh, could, you, could you explain a bit, like high level, uh, what that blog post was about and what, what got you to get into that idea? Yeah, sure. Um, so homomorphic encryption is actually an idea that I'm, I'm a little bit newer on myself, definitely newer than, than deep learning uh, to the extent that uh, deep learning is, is has a lot more um, activity around it lately. Um, so what it what it, I guess I should probably summarize what it is because um, it's not a really commonly known idea. Um, it's really it comes out of encryption, so it's a form of encryption. Um, however, um, the encrypted data is stored in such a way where you can perform operations um, on the data that is encrypted, um, such that like if someone hands me encrypted data, I can multiply it times two. And then when I pass the encrypted data back to someone else and they decrypt it, the underlying thing will be multiplied by, by two, but I, I didn't actually know what was inside of it. Um, so it's kind of a fascinating thing that you can, you can do these mathematical operations on top of data that you can't see. Um, and so what the blog post is really about um, 
is, is sort of inverting um, a really popular use of a homomorphic encryption. So people have have taken um, homework encryption and encrypted data and then trained neural nets on that data. There's a startup around that called Numeri um, and a myriad of other works that are being done on that. Um, so what the blog post was about is saying, okay, can we actually get a practical implementation where instead we encrypt the, the, the neural network and run that on decrypted data? Um, and, and the interesting thing about encryption is that you can kind of have this, this power imbalance where one person knows how to encrypt things and another person knows how to decrypt things and that can be separate. Um, so that created the opportunity for, um, for neural nets that, that, you know, someone could train the neural net on their own data, but um, the, the ability to kind of decode it is, is separate um, um, from, that, from that training. So I thought it was kind of a fascinating idea. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It was it was a very fascinating idea, um, and I encourage you guys to check it out if you haven't. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, that was a cool idea, and uh, it's interesting that you know Trask, you're able to think of these ideas, and you know you are in an academic environment, which which is beneficial for that. I a question that I thought of is uh, academia versus industry, and and Kelvin will also be able to speak on this. But uh, uh, let me start off with you. Uh, do you, for someone just getting into deep learning, would you recommend uh, the academic environment, the in industry environment, strong opinions? Um, man, so someone who just left um, industry to go back into academia, um, I do have some strong opinions on that, but but the good news is is that the the best environments are, are online um, and in the communities that you're developing now. So, I mean, even even being in the course and being able to talk to people on Slack uh, to kind of learn who to follow on Twitter. I mean, even people who are, are uh, you know, working at DeepMind uh, on some of the most secret state-of-the-art stuff um, um, are, are still on Twitter watching to see what someone halfway around the world is working on. Um, so the, the good news is, is that things are, are shared really collaboratively. Um, and if you just kind of set up a really good stream of information, um, you can kind of get caught in the middle of that and really uh, get to learn a lot of interesting exchange of ideas, just like Ian was, was talking about. Um, um, so, I mean, the good news is you can develop in, in, in either place. Um, I think that, that after that, it's really just about what you want to work on. If you want to work on things that, that companies uh, can use to make money, well, then you should probably go work in the industry. Uh, and if your fascination draws you towards something that, that uh, maybe is a little more long term and, and isn't as immediately capitalizable, then, then you know, spend some time in academia. Uh, that's probably the right balance. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Kelvin, did you, did you have something to say on the topic? Sure. Uh, I think it depends on your personality and what you perceive your place in the world is. Let's say you think you're already really capable. I think the part of democratized opportunity we have in 2017 is you, you, can, you don't need any degrees and you can just go out and start your own company, right? Every, all the resources are available already. But it's a revolving door anyways. It's the, I think the line is very blurred if you look at academic versus industry. But in, we, were talking to, we were talking earlier before we started, Ian says, you know, in industry, which we also find that you have a lot more resources, a lot more data, but maybe you're a little more constrained in terms of what you can work on because it is a little more product driven. But, if you, and, but it also depends on, I think, what kind of a person you are. If you're highly mathematical and a research person, I think academia is a great place to be. But if you're a little more hands-on, I think the industry is maybe more a place to be. And that is actually the role of, that we are trying to play at DLI, which is that we're specifically focusing on applied deep learning. DLI is our NVIDIA's Deep Learning Institute. It just got created last year. And the purpose is to really make people start right away. Right? Uh, one crude analogy will be, do you want to learn how to build an engine or change the engine oil? And what kind of person or what, what draws you more towards? Because you can do a lot of cool things in either places. So it really just depends on your capabilities, where your interests are. I would say. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, that's it for, for now for my questions. Let, let, let me answer some questions that you guys have asked. So we, I have a list of questions that have been asked by students. So one that I thought was particularly interesting uh, was by Thomas, and it's for any of, any of us. How can deep learning help poor countries? How can deep learning help poor countries? How can it alleviate poverty? 
Uh, yeah, go for it. I think deep learning will allow automated economy where the basics of human needs can be met. And a recent book came out where it says three things were keeping humanity and society down in general. One was famine, two is war, and three is disease. And if you really think about it in 2017, in developed world, we have a good handle on it. We don't have it in poor countries or undeveloped world. And I came from one such country. So to me, the power of deep learning is through education and autom autom uh, automated economy. That changes the equation. So you know, the poor countries, one of the problems with poor countries is that they have lost generations of teachers, two, three generations. It's not actually possible to educate the teachers first and then the population. But through deep learning and AI, we can actually accelerate and open up the access to those poor countries and they can benefit, assuming we solve the energy problem. Nice. Cool. Uh, so. Yeah, I'd actually really like to add a little bit to that, if that's uh, okay. Um, the, man, <laughs> not, not to like tout Udacity at, at a Udacity event, but I think probably the biggest thing that the deep learning can do for people is, is create an industry where it doesn't matter where you live, um, that you can create value based on what you can learn online. Um, you know, back when we were farmers, uh, to, to kind of riff on that analogy, it, it didn't matter if you, if you knew how to do it, if you didn't have the right tools and you weren't sitting in the right arable land, um, you couldn't create value. Um, but with kind of the services that are being provided here, you know, anyone born anywhere can can both teach and, and learn this stuff. Um, uh, I mean, goodness, I'm, I'm sitting, what, five, six, seven thousand miles away, and we're here to have this conversation. Um, so, yeah, a big, big thumbs up to everything going on at Udacity in, in that regard, because um, I think that's the tip of the spear for, for those benefits. Totally, yeah. Um... Yeah, and I, I remember having a conversation with a friend of, of having a personal AI teacher who just knows ex knows you really well, knows your personality, and is able to tailor exactly what it, in, in the exact language that would be most beneficial to you, right? It's just an optimization problem. It would know exactly what to say, when to say it, to get you interested, to s keep you interested. It would know your, it would know everything about you. It would be awesome. So yeah, I think having a personal AI assistant that is essentially your personal teacher would do wonders to help alleviate poverty by giving people the skills they need to succeed in this very fast, exponentially changing economy that we are living in today. It's kind of like the se season finale of life. Will there be another season? Who knows? Hopefully there will be. So okay, so that's okay. So that was a good question. Another one is for working on projects. Is our are our own laptops fine, or w will we get any systems from Udacity? So perhaps Matt could speak on that. Yeah. Um, can you all hear me? Good. Yes. So, um, so firstly, we have uh, done a little partnership with Amazon, and we were able to get some credits for um, like EC2 machines. So it's like cloud instances, you can get GPUs. Um, we're also starting a partnership with Floyd Hub, um, and they just make it super easy to launch a, a cloud instance with a GPU, like run your notebooks, run your your uh, like scripts that are training uh, networks. Um, super great. So um, yeah, we're, we're going to give you like a lot of, of resources so you can like train with GPUs. Um, I've been using, like personally, I've been using Floyd Hub a lot. Um, so I just have like my laptop, and if I want to train a network, and like I, I just say like, hey, Floyd Hub, give me a GPU, and then they do, and it's super awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, I've been very impressed uh, by Udacity's offerings. Uh, I remember like in the Slack channel, because uh, I have my own Slack as well. Uh, some of the students requested that you don't have to the, the past conversation history doesn't get erased, but then you have to pay like six dollars per student, and then you Udacity was just like, yeah, let's do it. It's actually like a lot of money, like hundreds of thousands of dollars for that. But yeah, so Udacity definitely cares about their students, so th that is awesome. Cool, so that is a question. So I just got a live question that wasn't recorded, and so the live question is, what are the limitations of deep learning? Is there anything deep learning can't do? Uh, so, Ian, you might you might have something on that. Yeah. Uh, well, in general, in machine learning, there's a theorem called the no free lunch theorem, 
that says that if you average over all possible problems, then every learning algorithm actually gets the same performance. So what that tells us is that deep learning isn't necessarily better than the other machine learning algorithms. It means that it corresponds more closely to the problems that we've tried to solve with it so far. And so someday we might find other problems where deep learning doesn't generalize as well. We think that deep learning is working really well in cases where there's a nested structure and the different layers of the network help to encode that nested structure. So you can think of sentences are composed out of phrases and phrases are composed out of individual words and objects are composed out of object parts and then they have edges that you can see in images. So these really structured hierarchical problems are naturally suited for deep learning. But we might find some other ones where there's just so much noise or unusual structure that isn't really captured with that kind of hierarchy, where some kind of simpler machine learning model might work better. I think, uh, so deep learning and, and NVIDIA, we've been working on an analogy. It's like a hammer. It's really useful for a lot of things. Try to screw with it, put a screw with it. Not necessarily the perfect fit. So it's, it's a tool, and I think this is, a, this degree being an inner degree foundation, it's appropriate that you'll learn what a tool is and what it can and it can't do. I think there's nothing in the world that can do everything. It's about finding the alignment between whatever the problem you're trying to solve and the particular tool that you have in your toolkit and tool set. And I think that's what education is about, having that more fuller toolkit that you can pull the appropriate tool for the, the particular task that you're trying to solve. Yeah, great points, great points. Yeah, and to add on to that, just training on less data, right? I don't want to have to use AWS all the time. I'm kind of jealous of people who are just, you know, uh, building like very simple algorithms for games that don't require any kind of compute. I mean, that's more than your standard CPU on a laptop. I look forward to that point where we can get there, where we don't need boatloads of data, and that would just democratize it even further. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's another thing. Let's see, what else? We have other questions here coming in live. Uh, let's see, so here's, here's a good one. And then we can go to Trask's uh, presentation. So the question is, can GANs be used to generate handwriting similar to how kids write? They make wrong strokes and something like that. We have seen RNNs do that, but can GANs be able to do that? And how can we generate? Any advice would be very helpful. And that is for Ian, specifically. Uh, in principle, they should be able to. I don't know if anybody has tried. We have used GANs to generate handwriting, but not in the way that kids do. We have them generate the pixels of the image instead of generating the control instructions for how to move the pen to write different letters. But what you could do is take one of the RNN architectures that people already use and have, have that be the generator. And then the discriminator could look either at the image that it produces or could actually just be like a sequence to sequence model that looks at the sequence of strokes that are output. As long as you have a data set that's captured in terms of a list of strokes, that would work. If you only have a data set in terms of the pixels, then what you'd probably want to do is take the strokes that come out of the generator rasterize those and then feed the raster image to the discriminator. Interesting. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see more content around all this stuff. Uh, cool. So yeah, so now we're going to go to Andrew. He's going to do a short presentation. So Andrew, feel free. The floor yeah. is yours. OK, man, I'm glad you mentioned sequence sequence models. I think I'm going to just kind of share my screen. Um, got, I got a few kind of graphics I'm going to show you as well. Um, so bear with me one second. Can you see uh, deep learning and language across the top? Yes. Yep. Hopefully. We saw ourselves for a second. That's us. That's okay. Now you're good. All right. See a slide. Ready to go. All right. Very good. So. Um, uh, I'm actually just starting my PhD, um, and uh, it's really focused on uh, deep learning and, and I guess, and language. So what I thought I'd talk to you guys about today is kind of my personal survey for where the field is uh, at the moment, what's interesting kind of in, in 2017, and where we think that kind of the, the next breakthroughs should generally show up. 
Um, so these are kind of the things that I, I think are kind of the biggest uh, things in the landscape in 2017. Um, we'll go through them pretty quickly, and it's really pretty high level, and I can just give you th these as well if there are any links that you're interested in. Um, so the first big one is language modeling. So um, it's, it's a task I should really introduce uh, as just predicting the next word. So, so if you think, think you know, Andrew and Amber went to the beach and built a blank, and in your head you fill that in with maybe sandcastle. Um, the, the amount of logic that it took for you to do that is actually, you know, quite complex. Um, you know, you had to understand what two different people are, them arriving to a location, um, and, and what can be done in that location, that a sandcastle can be constructed, that it's very likely for them to construct a sandcastle. Um, and, and there are some statistics that can kind of shortcut to that, but, but what we really want machines to be able to do when they're understanding language or not, and really more generally understanding life is to be able to to make these kinds of predictions much like a, a human is able to do at a very high degree of accuracy. So language modeling originally came out from from kind of encryption, um, or I guess decryption rather, uh, during the war when we were trying to decrypt German codes. Um, but today it's used for all sorts of things. So um, as Ian just said, um, uh, sequence, sequence models um, are, are incredibly powerful um, tools that we use to implement language models. Um, however, the task of language modeling by itself is something that we think of as just a, a very difficult but human-like task that requires human-like intelligence. So uh, we also augment it to create, do things like translation, where we'll, you know, uh, kind of put these long sequences together. You know, the, the first part might be in French and the second part might be in English. And then we'll give the sequence sequence model the French part and say, all right, um, given these first few words, predict the next few words. And we do this for question answering and dialogue as well. And the real big advantage here is that we have tons and tons of data to do this. So, so this is what makes it an interesting problem. Like it's a problem that is both very, very hard, but we also have a tremendous amount of data to try to solve. Um, and the thing that we usually try to solve it with are these sequence sequence models. So this is just this is still a little bit historical. We're kind of working up to 2017. Um, sequence sequence models, which I suppose you've, you've heard of at this point, um, are really kind of the state of the art algorithm for being able to do this. Um, and it's really, it's, it's an LSTM that first encodes a sequence of inputs. So in this case, it's a French sentence. And then we hope that it will create a representation in this kind of orange area here uh, and then be able to decode it afterwards. Now, here's where we are in 2017. In 2017, and I guess late 2016, we're really kind of sobering up to the strengths and weaknesses of LSTMs. Um, when they first came out um, and sequence sequence models in, in 2014, uh, they, they broke a lot of records for, for a variety of tasks between then and now. Um, but we're really starting to understand uh, what, where these things sort of fall down. Um, and the biggest one is called long range dependencies. So when you think about this section of this French sentence on the bottom left, where it says les chines, or however you pronounce that. Um, and then over here on the right, it says dogs love, right? The number of steps that the information has to progress to be able to go from les chines and remember it all the way up to dogs love is actually pretty far. And it's indeterminately far, which can make it even more difficult for the model. Um, and this goes back to something that Ian just referred to. Um, one model is is stronger than another model, based primarily on what it learns first, what it what it likes to learn, what it's what it's biased to learn. So in deep learning, this has commonly been hierarchy. In this case, short range dependencies have been what sequence sequence models and LSTMs are are pretty good at learning. And those short range lexical dependencies, you know, I'm saying short range being a, around a sentence. However, when we want to do more complex things, like you know, when you think about Google search, um, you, know, you can have tremendously long range dependencies across millions and millions of documents. These things tend to struggle. So big theme in 2017, LSTMs and sequence sequence models are a little bit simpler than we expected. Um, the first thing is they have a fixed size memory for a variable size needs, which is something we kind of always knew, but we, we hoped would not be true around things like thought vectors and, 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 and that kind of work. Um, we also found that sequence sequence models mostly attend to short range dependencies um, instead of instead of actually looking into long range dependencies, which are more interesting. So they they tend to try to predict the next word given just the few previous words, as opposed to you know some other relevant information perhaps in a different document. And finally, they're really poor at one shot and and memory style recall. So if we if we give a LSTM or sequence sequence model something to translate, right? Um, you know, maybe it's a really simple Spanish sentence like hola, and we say, all right, hola means hello. Got it? And then we give it hola again. Um, unfortunately, it's actually not really going to say hello the first time that we show it. We have to show it over and over and over again, mixed in with millions of other examples for it to actually really figure out these two languages. However, humans, and particularly children, when they're learning language, when you give them an example, they latch onto it right away. 
And this is something that we really want to be able to mimic. So the kind of general field of interest um, for specifically in, in language, but also more generally in deep learning, are these neural memory modules. What we hope these neural memory modules will be able to do is alleviate a lot of these problems that we're seeing, these weaknesses we're seeing in LSTMs. So this brings us into kind of neural memory. Um, so neural memory kind of have this little wish list for it, things we wanted to be able to do. Um, and it's really just the inverse of the weaknesses that LSTMs uh, have been shown to have when we really push them to their extremes. Now, just to kind of give you an example of what a neural memory can look like, we're going to talk about a neural stack. Um, and for, I guess, a little more on this, you can check out uh, some, some blog posts online. But neural stack, uh, if, you, if you've kind of gotten to know LSTMs and sequence sequence models a little bit, this little purple bar on the left is just the hidden state, right? And then we want to have this memory module on the right side that can access it and, and kind of serve as a long-term store. Now, you know, too much to get into right now, but this is just to give you an idea of, of what neural memory can be like. So an LSTM is doing its own business, and at some point it goes, hey, um, I don't really recognize this. I, I'm going to query my, my little neural stack here and see if there's something in here that's interesting that can help me solve a problem. Um, and that's really what it's all about. Another great paper to check out, um, I guess we're uh, going to try to keep this under 10 minutes here, but um, is a continuous cache paper that just came out a few weeks ago. It was a really interesting small little neural memory. Um, what they did was even simpler. They just kind of, uh, when they're making predictions in a language model, they look over a cache of the last 2,000 or so different predictions that they recently made. And if some of them look very similar, they tend to use that to help make the next prediction. Now they do that via dot product and a few other more complicated things, but the, the general idea is that they want to keep around a cache of what they've seen very recently to help them make the same prediction. Again, this is the idea of extending the, the uh, kind of longer and longer range dependencies or longer and longer distance information from the prediction that's being made at this moment um, uh, to information that might be, might be relevant, but it's just a little farther off. Next thing is that data sets are sometimes greater than equal to models. And this, this really plays off of um, one part of what makes generative adversarial networks so exciting um, is that uh, for a lot of these more complex tasks, what we really need is, is more and more data um, as opposed to a, a simpler model. So one, one, on the one hand, you can, you can generate a better model that, that captures a certain type of information faster, or you can have a lot more information that helps a simpler model be able to, to model something that's actually more complex. So um, another big theme. Um, one that I think that a lot of people have uh, really latched onto in industry lately, you know, you're asking about industry versus academia, um, is chatbots. So QA and chatbots, uh, I've really seen a lot of progress. Uh, and I think it's mostly based on industry demand as opposed to increased in the core technology. Um, so be a little bit wary about, about um, uh, any chatbot projects that you might want to take on. Um, because they are quite difficult. They do tend to be a little bit hand engineered, but there has been some, some, some progress on them as well as QA. Um, I guess well, I, I couldn't leave without uh, doing a, a plug for PyTorch, um, which has also recently become um, kind of my favorite go-to framework. Um, there's some really good reasons for that here. And um, yeah, so I guess with that, those are kind of the, the highlights for, for language um, and for deep learning in general for this year. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions on it, be, be happy to chat about it. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, language. Language is very interesting. Natural language processing. Uh, Kurzweil said that language is the seat of intelligence. Uh, and now he's director of engineering at Google. So yeah, deep learning. Let's take a little bit of a tangent for a little bit. Let's talk about something else that's still related to AI, but not necessarily deep learning. Here's a question for, uh, for any of you guys. The question is, Uber AI Labs just hired a number of people who specialize in evolutionary algorithms and deep learning. What are your thoughts on the role of evolutionary algorithms in the future of deep learning? Do we have any takers? Evolution works really well when you don't have another option. Uh, but it doesn't make use of gradients. So there's a lot of cases where it's really difficult or expensive to get the gradients. And in those cases, it'll work well for you. If you're in a case where you can get a gradient, then why would you ignore it? Um, so gradient descent is usually better, but we might start to see evolution be useful for things like 
agents that need to go out and interact with their environment for a very long time before they get a reward. It's hard to back propagate a gradient all the way through the lifetime of a really long lived agent. And that's where evolution can start to show us a big advantage. Okay, also to add on, this is just for me. So the so synthetic gradients was like this really cool paper that came out of DeepMind. Um, but I didn't see it use the, that idea again. But I thought like, okay, so this is gonna make back propagation obsolete. This is such a cool idea. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that, that idea of synthetic gradients? Do you see that? Do you see that as a possible next step after um, the backpropagation technique? I haven't followed the synthetic gradients work really closely, but my understanding is essentially it gets around the problem of backpropagation taking more time when you have more layers. It lets you parallelize different many batches of data. Uh, researchers are often not working as hard to really optimize the performance characteristics of their model. Researchers want to work on as simple a setup as possible, so that if something doesn't work, the researcher knows why it didn't work. Uh, that means it's going to be kind of a while before researchers adopt synthetic gradients, just because anything that could interfere with the simplicity of their model has to have a really, really big payoff. And most of the time, the cost of doing n different steps of propagation to get a gradient is not such a high cost to bear that researchers are bothered by it. Great answer. So yeah, uh, back propagation. A lot of, I mean, a lot of the advances we've seen is because back because of back propagation being such a useful algorithm, supervised learning, where we where we are recursively taking an error value and propag propagating it backwards in a network. A lot of the advances in image recognition and you know speech recognition, it's all because of back propagation, which is interesting because I'm I'm fairly certain, and if there's a neuroscientist around for some reason. You know, say something, but I'm fairly certain we don't use backpropagation in here. Uh, so it's interesting why that that works so well. In fact, I mean, we could go even more meta and say, well, we don't. Neural networks don't even exist on binary silicon transistors. They don't. They don't actually exist in physical space. Yet this idea of you know having this this series of connected layers of neurons gives us a very similar result to our own neurons, which are physical and have chemical properties, and you know. There are a bunch of neurotransmitters that are that are fired like serotonin. Instead, we are using you know this basic you know we're kind of hacked together this idea of a, a series of layers. That it's actually all just matrix math. You know the same you know very basic uh, math operations: addition, subtraction, multiplication. And yet it gives us these amazing results. So a lot of interesting ideas that haven't been explored to to think about biologically inspired ideas. I'm all about that. Uh, but yeah. Uh, that was a great answer. Another question from the audience is, actually, how about this? Do we have any questions from you guys? You guys can raise your hand. Let's let's keep it let's keep it real AF. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, you want to throw them the <laughs> nice catch. A plus. A hundred emoji on Slack. Hello. Okay, um, so my question is, um, going back to the data sets greater than or equal to models, right? Um, we talk about Udacity and democratizing uh, education, but how does someone get access to those data sets? Because um, all the advances that are happening are in large companies like Baidu or Google or, or Nvidia, right? So how, how does someone else get access to that? Because yes, we can, we can do like a Jupyter Notebook and you know, uh, you know, do Kaggle competitions, but for deep learning, you need like really large data sets, right? So. That's a great question. Man, that is a fantastic question. And I'm actually really glad you asked it because I, I, I missed something that I, I wanted to say on that um, that specifically answers your question. Probably the best part about that, that trend is that it actually favors people who are not necessarily in academia. People in academia um, have really good incentives to focus on data sets that have already been published because incremental increases in accuracy based on some improvement in the model or adding more hardware or, you know, various, various sundry things, you know, are more likely to get published. They're a little bit less risky, but, um, finding a new data set, uh, it's really about just knowing about the world. It's about, you know, like, like 
I mean, the big data set that, that my supervisor found um, was the Daily Mail and CNN. I mean, you know, these, these are not you know, kind of ivory tower type type advancements. These are somebody was walking down the street one day and said, wow, the Daily Mail has these really great headlines that we could totally turn into to, to fill in the blank style questions that the neural net had to read the article in order to be able to answer. This is a great, this could be a great data set. Let me build a scraper and go find it. Um, and go curate it. So, so the, the good thing here is that it, it actually favors you because everyone is on, is on an even playing field um, when when looking for these new data sets to create you know non-trivial advancements in the field. Um, so, man, next time you're out just out in the world looking around, try to say, hey, can I structure this into an interesting problem for a neural net to solve? Um, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at what you might find. Matt. Yeah, awesome, Trask. Um, can I add something here? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, so also at Udacity, the self-driving car program is releasing a whole bunch of open source data. Um, I think we've released something like 200 uh, gigabytes of like video of like, it's like two days worth of a car driving around Mountain View. Um, and so you can find uh, a lot of open source data sets like this. Um, and we're, of course, we're going to be releasing more data um, over time also. Um, so there's just, I think there's like a big movement for uh, a lot of, you know, companies and, and open source projects to start like releasing data um, like this. Because as, as as we're finding out, it's like you need a whole bunch of data to make these like deep learning networks learn, right? Um, and so we're just like, um, like Udacity and other places are just trying to help out this ecosystem of providing a whole bunch of data for everybody. Nice. Cool. So we're going to have uh, Kelvin do a presentation. But before we do, we do that, I'm going to we're going to answer one more question from the audience uh, in real time. Yes. Yeah. 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 So right now, there are many applications uh, for deep learning, like uh, computer vision and natural language processing and also many other different types of applications. So for the students, they, like uh, on Udacity, there are many different uh, Lalo degree programs. So do you think uh, how to choose the right program for those students? What, uh, do you have any idea, uh, suggestions for the students? Which topic they need to choose? And uh, do you think uh, which direction uh, may be the best? Thanks. Good question. So like between nano degrees, like the robotics nano degree and the AI nano degree and the deep learning. Matt? Yeah. Um, so I think our, so yeah, this deep learning program is more about like foundations, right? So it's just kind of learning um, a whole bunch of different deep learning techniques, like recovering uh, convolutional networks, recurrent networks, um, like reinforcement learning, GANs. Uh, but then like the, the car, uh, self-driving car nano degree, robotics nano degree, AI nano degree, they're all, those are like career ready programs, right? And so they are going to get you a job building self-driving cars and building robots. Um, and so, and then I think like the, the AI nano degree is going to be more like general and broad because robotics and self-driving cars are both branches of artificial intelligence. Um, but our, so our AI nano degree is going to be like a more broad and then those two are going to be um, like narrow specific uh, programs to get you jobs in those industries. So it kind of depends what you want to do. If you want like a, a broader base of artificial intelligence, then like AI would be better for you. Um, or if you want to go make cars or if you make robots, then those would be better options. Yeah. And and to add to that, it's, you know, you, you only want to learn what you need to learn. And here's why I'm saying that, because there's so much that you could learn. Your time is very valuable and you don't want to waste it having to learn things that you don't really need, right? So think about what it is that you want. This is actually not something that can be taught, like finding that internal inspiration of where, of what direction I should go. That is something, you know, greater than all of this. These are just tools to actualize that, that internal reality. Uh, actually, let me answer one more question. And this is, this one's actually from here. And I think it's an important question. Uh, will, deep, will the deep learning program teach from the very basic? The video is posted on Siraj Raval's YouTube channel, covers the topic, topic, covered the topics very quickly, and I was not able to understand anything because 
I have no prior knowledge of machine learning, not even stats and probability. Should I take this course? Will I be able to complete it in the six month period? That is a hard question to answer. So I'm gonna answer that. Here's what it is. Here's what it is. Deep learning is a combination of a lot of different fields, okay? Not just math and computer science, but you can think about neuroscience. Just think of it as a huge chain of dependencies going all the way down to English, right? Or just you know very basic things about uh, even biology that are outside of neuroscience. What I'm trying to say is this. The very basic can be a lot of different things. If you have an interest in deep learning and you want to learn it, this is the course. This is as good as it gets. And it's really, it's actually really good, okay? W are we gonna teach you the details of calculus and linear algebra and statistics? No, but we will teach you the parts that you need for this, okay? We are focused on applications, right? Each of the lessons is an application, whether it be image generation or, you know, art generation, you know, whatever it is. But they're focused on the applications. Along the way, we're gonna have all sorts of resources, all sorts of con all content to make that a reality. So, and from the start we said Python, basic Python syntax is the prerequisite and uh, linear algebra. So those are the two. If you've, if you've got those two things down, I'm confident that you can learn this stuff. Because why? Because I am learning this stuff and I have been learning this stuff. Am I special? No, yes, but we're all special in that way. I'm not like some god or something, <laughs> right? I'm a human, okay? And if I can do it, you can too, the guy who ans asked the question. Okay, so that's the question. And Yeah, Ian. And if you do want a source to learn linear algebra, uh, www.deeplearningbook.org, uh, free to read online. Uh, chapter two, I believe, is all about linear algebra and focuses exactly on the kinds of things you'll need to do deep learning. And I guess the person asking the question sounds like the kind of person who doesn't like to have just a high level overview. I'm the kind of person who likes to have things spelled out in excruciating detail, and I wrote that chapter, so I think it'll probably work for that kind of reader and get you ready for whatever you need to know for the courses. Yes, cool, so to Kelvin's presentation. Kelvin? Okay, so DLI was created to kind of address all this kind of recent questions, turns out. Because deep learning is such a breath kind of feel where people come from different directions, right? And I don't know how much you guys are in with internet and everything since the 2000s, but let's imagine what it takes to create a website in 2000 or even 96 when it came out with AltaVista search engines versus 2017, right? When someone says, I'm a web developer or I can create a web page, what does that mean? That can mean a lot of different things. Some people just use a WordPress to do a blog and they can do a lot of nice things, right? Or you can write a very highly, highly scalable, highly secure things that require Scala backend and React Facebook, all these things. So let's not loss uh, yourself when you talk about deep learning or a particular thing because it can mean a lot of things for a lot of people, right? So I think that, that's why I try to use a web analogy. Anybody can slap a web page, but it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. So we have people coming from data science background, usually in deep learning. Developers coming, which means mainly coders, so uh, people who don't have any trouble with the Python requirement. But because they don't have data science background, they're like, what does that mean to be normalized and standardized data set? Like, what do you mean? Like, or uh, what is validation and how, how do I deal with this? And then some people are like, why is math required? Why is everything math required? It's like, well, thankfully for you guys, you're not going to grad school, but I found out recently, not that recently, but political science require math. So a lot of grad schools just require math. And in DLI, we kind of took a step back and said, look, I used the engine analogy earlier. What if instead of just changing oil, I want to learn how to tune the engine so it runs really fast and the car is really great for racing or something like that? Do you need to learn how to build that engine? Not necessarily. You just need to learn how to turn which knob, which way, and experiment and not be afraid to blow up that engine. Right? So, 
deep learning is kind of like that. Number one thing you can do for yourself is kind of get started on it and try things out. It's not going to be comfortable because we can almost assure you that you don't have all the background necessary. Otherwise, you will be making like $5 million <laughs> kind of thing. Right? That's sort of the NFL quarterback going rate, apparently. So this. <laughs> and the other tertiary question that you asked earlier about, which one do you choose? That seems to be another question that's coming to DLI. Because we say, look, it's hands-on, apply learning. You take this. you. You know, and we try to simple, simplify things. That's the basic of teaching, which is that we try to abstract away things you don't need, just like um, compiling and make files from coding background. We try to do that with one click on an IDE, things like that. And we try to do the same thing in uh, DLI, where we already spun up the Amazon GPU enable instances for you, and you're using Python Notebook, and you just need a web browser to kind of get started. But then what we're realizing is that what a lot of people want is guidance. It's like, how do I make these decisions? And some of us who are sitting on this side says, you just do. And people are like, how? <laughs> They're like, I can't jump. They're like, just jump. You're like, no, I don't want to jump, right? So uh, it turns out it's actually not that divorced from the whole education problem in general. And I think you have to understand that the world is complex, and you kind of have to separate motivation versus engagement kind of thing. So you have to find your own motivation. You guys are a little bit older or whatever, and I'm used to talking to 18-year-olds. But it's like, <laughs> it's, um, in general, you find what is important to you. And, and we don't mean just to learn deep learning for the sake of deep learning. It's a tool, remember. Use it for something that you hold dear, or something that you think about in your spare time, and you want to do or do something for the world for yourself, then see if deep learning is appropriate tool to do that particular goal, and then learn that. Or maybe it's a self-driving car. Maybe it's an AI program. Whatever the things are available, that's what you do. And on this side, Udacity, DLI side, what we try to do is solve the engagement side, like Siraj, really good about the engagement, where we keep you interested and give you just hard enough thing that you keep going so you don't become hopeless, but you don't also become bored. And that adjustment, as Siraj pointed out earlier, is in, impossible when we have 1,000 students across the board. So again, turns out the answer is deep learning in the context of AI for one-to-one -one personalized learning. And that should be one of the societal goals that we have. And you know, so yeah, in general, that's kind of what we're trying to go across with NVIDIA. And as you said, some of the advantage of industry is there is resources. There are lots of uh, data sets. And a self-driving car, for example, the, you know, the nano degree and we're working on, it's not easy. Because all the security problem that Ian talked about, it exists there. Natural language processing that Andrew talked about, it exists there. And if you look in this room and we ask everybody to speak, I will surmise that there will be a lot of different ways of pronunciation and different accents, right? So in the car, in the AI cockpit, if it's going to be able to understand everybody from every country and every culture, how is it going to do that? Well, it turns out if you compare the lip reading versus the voice, lip reading is accent agnostic for a given language. It's about 90% or higher accuracy. Turns out people, even with the different accents, move their lips similarly. So one data is not enough, but two with audio and both visual combined together. And that's kind of the exciting thing that NVIDIA thinks we can work on. Because the big difference between what you said about research, Andrew said about research, is in academia, you can focus on the minutia of an idea or a segment and then go really deep on it. But when you try to bring like something like self-driving car, production issues are huge. And it's very, very complex. So you can only do that with a big team. Very, you know, it's a lot of work. It's really hard. Because if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And there'd be no value. Right? So that's kind of where NVIDIA and DLI is trying to do. We're trying to solve really hard problems and try to sort of bring guidance to people in terms of what they need and try to what I call the rock climbing model. I don't know if all of you have rock climbed before. But 
an expert can climb really fast. But what you want in an education is a leader model. I'm just one step ahead of you, like Siraj said. And I know how I pass through that particular step. And I'm not so divorced from you that I'm like, ah, that's easy, just jump. I said, no, that one is a little tricky, so try grabbing it this way. So you give a very pointed advice from just one or two steps ahead. And that's, I think, is one of the ways that I think peer-to-peer -peer learning and one-to-one -one learning can really help uh, sort of address these kind of personal needs. Because everybody sort of go in the same direction, but people take their unique path. But how do we make it so that we can actually keep track of it? Well said, well said. Cool. So we've got about five minutes left. So I want to, before we close out, uh, answer some questions from the audience. Maybe one last one. Does anybody have a question? We got someone way in the back. Thanks. So um, speaking of accents and changing the world, um, I have a question for you. Um, we normally see that data new data in new industries normally results in an AI revolution in that industry. And we know there's lots, almost everything is going to be changed by AI in the future. So given we want to cure diseases, we want to make new scientific discoveries with AI, we want to uplift uh, poor countries, what are some of the data sets that, and this is a question for all of you guys on the panel, what are some of the data sets that you would love to see start coming up, almost like the image net of health or education or what have you to kind of revolutionize those industries? That is a great question. I think there's a 10-year uh, candle program to cure cancer. That, and we hear a lot of collaboration going on because it's apparent that you need a lot of data, or at least for the traditional deep learning, because supervised learning, you just need a lot of data. So people are collaborating, and you know, and cancer in 10 years, so self-driving car, for example. Uh, almost every industry you can think of is, is doing it, whether, and Kaggle competition, things like that. You know, people are trying to have uh, these data sets, and people are publishing them. There's actually another data set called Cityscape. It actually has all of these urban landscape, because highway driving versus urban landscape is slightly different, if you can imagine, right? Like, the needs for that is. And you need a much more accurate thing so that you don't run into stuff in tight European streets or something like that. So I, I see a lot of collaboration from NVIDIA kind of perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and then another thing I thought of is uh, city planning. So the government has a lot of data. Local governments have a lot of data. So it's important to think of all of these things as optimization problems. When you study this stuff long enough, even a couple months, you'll start to think of, everything in terms of optimization, where there is some loss function, whether literal or metaphorical, that you want to minimize. So in this case, it would be poverty. Poverty is what we want to minimize. We're trying to optimize for the objective, which is to reduce poverty. One way of doing that is with city data. So cities have lots of data in terms of how they invest the, g the money that they have. So in this, so maybe something we could think about is a correlation here. And this is a data science exercise, but what is correlated with high poverty that governments have access to? Crime, right? Usually in areas of high poverty, there's high crime. How do we minimize crime? How do we best invest our resources as a governing body to reduce crime? Well, we can fund this, we can fund public roads, we can fund education, but what is the optimal way of funding these things? We're actually very bad at thinking about the answer to this. We might think that we're good, but we're actually very bad. And why are we very bad? Because we can't have this high-level overview of all this data. We have five senses. The input-output bandwidth is not, is not as great as it needs to be for high-dimensional data that we have access to. This is where machines excel. So urban planning is a good one, and also, uh, resources. How do we best allocate these resources? Right, crop production. And how do we feed the most people with the minimum amount and have that distributed? So then there's supply chain. How do we best supply this at the lowest cost? Everything is really an optimization problem in the end. So there's a lot of ways that we can do this. And right now, we'd, be, we'd probably be surprised to learn how much of it is happening off the cuff by some guy or girl who's just like, 
nah, I guess we'll, else we'll alloc allocate this and we'll see what happens. And it's not, ne it's not necessarily because of some malintent, it's just because that's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that we can improve with AI when it comes to poverty reduction. Hey. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Hey, Zaraj, can I add uh, one to that? Yes. Um, so this one's a little bit related to the homomorphic encryption topic we were talking about a little bit before. Um, I have a lot of friends who are working on kind of the, the health side of things, and that's, that includes mental health, physical health. Um, and the real big problem is, is, yeah, they have like two samples because, you know, five people got a disease and they collected data on two of them. Um, but the real, the real big issue here is not that the data doesn't exist. It's that it can't be released in such a way that models can be trained on it, but um, people's privacy isn't at risk. Um, so on the one hand, I would like to see more data sets released, but what I'd really like to see are interfaces through which um, people can submit their lives for scientific study in a way that doesn't compromise their privacy. Um, and that's why actually why I'm so excited about tools like homomorphic encryption, even though right now, to be honest, they're, they're really slow. Like a lot of work needs to be done to get us there. But if we could actually get to the point where we can protect people's privacy and yet generate data sets like, you know, what does someone do during their day in the weeks before they decide to commit suicide? Or what does someone do in their day in the weeks before they they commit a crime or, or something like that? Like where, where we can get them help or, or, you know, just early detection of these, these really deeply personal but very valuable things. Um, it's less about whether the data exists or not, and I think more about figuring out a way to do it where people don't get hurt in the process of that data being collected or curated um, for what it's worth. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think one of the most exciting changes we'll see is a uh, move toward interfaces for letting learning algorithms go out and operate in different locations. Um, homomorphic encryption is one path toward getting access to more of this private data without revealing it to the world. Uh, another one is a technique called differential privacy. And I think both of them are great and will really change the way that we use things. Great points. Cool, so let's uh, do a short outro. So basically closing words. Um, I'll start off with you, Ian. Any, any closing words? Just maybe a plug to something you want people to check out? There's an event at the United Nations this summer called AI for Good. And I guess a common theme of the evening has been how can AI help to reduce poverty and what kind of data sets do we want to see released. Uh, I'm hoping one outcome of AI for good is we'll all learn a lot more about what data sets the different agencies at the UN has and how we can help them out. So I think we can't help as humans to make uh, powerful tools as we've shown in our history, at least that's known, uh, because we didn't destroy ourselves. Uh, but what AI can help to counter that is we can actually make better humans being who can wield that power responsibly. Andrew? Yeah, uh, there are tremendous opportunities already to do great good and great evil. Um, please consider what you go work for. Um, I think the first one for me that comes to mind that people might not realize is working in advertising is building algorithms that intentionally persuade people to do things that they wouldn't normally do. So um, before you go work on an ad engine somewhere or, or a recommender engine or something else that help someone sell stuff, uh, just consider what you're doing and what else you can do with your time. Matt? So, my turn? Yes, uh, any closing words? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, just like um, everybody else has said, I mean, deep learning and AI in general is just gonna greatly affect like our, our world coming up. Um, like the next five years, you're gonna see a lot of changes. I mean, we're gonna start getting automated cars, I'm going to save millions and millions of lives every year. Um, so, yeah, I'm just like, I'm really excited. I hope everybody else is excited for this, like, new world we're coming into. For sure. Uh, and for me, it would be that this stuff isn't just going to happen, right? It's not just some entity that's just, yes, it's, it's happening and everything's getting better. It only happened. Good things like this only happen if smart people put in the time and effort and energy to make them happen. You guys are those people, okay? and people watching live. You are the people who are going to solve these problems. And if it's not you, it's not gonna be anybody else, right? Not many people know about deep learning. In our bubbles, in our mind, we think like, yes, this is all, no. If you, and this is just me pulling these numbers out of nowhere. If we were to just survey like, you know, the United States population, probably like 2% of the US knows anything about deep learning, right? 
Not many people know about this. It's important to spread AI awareness, and the way we do that is to work on it, be excited about it, and if we do this, we can solve m some of the greatest problems of our time. So, Luis? Hello, yes. Uh, well, that was a lot of fun. I learned, I learned a lot, so I want to first of all thank uh, Siraj and uh, our speakers, uh, Ian, Kelvin, uh, Andrew, and Matt. Uh, why don't we give them a round of applause?